I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with two guests, actually. Catherine Newman, who's a sociologist and an award-winning author who's written several books on inequality, poverty, and the working poor. And also, I talk with Elizabeth Jacobs, who is also a sociologist and an expert on inequality, poverty, and economic mobility and how those subjects intersect with public policy. Catherine Newman and Elizabeth Jacobs join me to discuss their new book titled Moving the Needle, What Tight Labor Markets Do for the Poor. It's a really fascinating read, especially because we are currently in a tight labor market. The current job market has created conditions for the working poor that present better job opportunities, more mobility, and better benefits in some cases. So if you want to know how all that works together, please enjoy this instructive conversation with Catherine Newman and Elizabeth Jacobs. Catherine Newman, Elizabeth Jacobs, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. So the current unemployment rate is about 3.4%, I believe, and that's the lowest it's been in a half a century. So my first question actually is a really fundamental one. How did we get here? Let me take a crack at that and then turn it over to Elizabeth. There are many reasons why we're in this situation. Some of it has to do with declining birth rates and lower entry into the labor force than in the past. Some of it has to do with early exits, especially of men from the labor force who seem to be retiring at earlier ages. Some of it has to do with diminished uh, diminished contributions, if you will, from immigrants or from immigration. So we cut immigration and that limits who comes into the labor market. Some of it has to do with high growth rates. We had very high growth rates for a long time. And although the recession that came about because of COVID was very sharp. It was also historically fast. So we had a real V-shaped recovery to what had already been very tight labor markets. So you put all of these things together and you're talking about uh, just an extraordinary change in the labor market down to, as you said, a 53-year low of unemployment. And that's what we were interested in learning about. What are the consequences of operating an economy under those conditions? It's historically unprecedented. Elizabeth, do you want to add to that? I think you basically covered it. I was trying to think about whether, particularly in light of the aftermath of the sort of what I what I like to call the the dark COVID days, right? Like deep COVID, and where where we are now. I think there's there's something around all of those factors combined, plus the fact that. This intuitive sense that there are just certain things about what people expect from and want from work that may have changed somewhat and really changed folks' calculus for uh, for working and what kind of work they they want and what how they're how they're willing to show up in the labor market and for what and that's part of what we talk about in the book. There've been real advantages to workers, particularly workers who have been trying to get a foot in for quite some time in terms of really improving on some fronts, wages, job quality, etc. We can talk more about that, but I do think that part of what's behind a tight labor market now as well. It's just like a shifting of the the calculus behind how workers versus employers think about what work means and what role it plays in their lives. On the surface, of course, low unemployment is good, but the stage we're in right now has broader implications. Um, you know, people working is great, but it has implications to the tight labor market has implications on, on poverty and inequality. So can you talk more about that? What the low unemployment rate is doing for people broadly? Well, I think our view is that for people broadly, there is no better circumstance than tight labor markets. It advantages each worker, uh, enabling them to get the most out of their credentials when they go to seek work. It forces employers to create more job ladders internally because they have a hard time recruiting people from the outside. It tends to encourage people who've been on the sidelines, often for many years of unemployment, to come back into the labor market because they're getting better wages and they have more opportunity. So there's certain categories of people who often are blocked from jobs, people coming out of the prison system, for example, often single mothers who can only work part time. There are many groups who have been categorically excluded or treated with less interest by employers. And all of a sudden, under these conditions, they are highly sought after. And we see unemployment rates diving among uh, returning citizens. We see the rate of labor force participation for women rising. We see the returns to their households growing. Uh, In terms of poverty, it has very beneficial effects. It lifts many people out of poverty altogether. And for many, exchanges non-working poverty for working poverty, which is not the best solution, but it puts people into a position where if there are improvements 
accessible to them, new jobs that they can qualify for, they're much more likely to be able to jump for those jobs once they're in the labor market than if they're not. So it's really hard for us to find negative sides of tight labor markets. There are certainly people who think that they're responsible for inflation. We beg to differ, and we can get into that later. But on the whole, it puts an enormous reward structure in the hands of people who badly need it. Elizabeth, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the other things, and Catherine mentioned this, is just the spillover effects, not just on reducing poverty rates more generally, but the spillover effects into communities. And we talk some about this in the book and looking at how when a neighborhood goes from largely non-working poor folks to largely working poor folks, it is still a neighborhood with real challenges, obviously. Um, the question about working poverty is, is a big one. But what that means in terms of just kind of the general feel of the neighborhood, the social cohesion of the neighborhood, the to modeling um, and what, what life looks like has real spillover effects that I think can be really quite beneficial for a place and for potentially future generations as well. So that's one piece. The other is thinking about what it means for families when you have folks working who are bringing in more resources and this is something that we also touch on based on you know conversations, interviews that we did with folks and also some of the, the quantitative data looking at what happens when folks, especially men, have the opportunity to earn more. There's a long history of declining marriage rates, particularly amongst folks with lower incomes, partners or potential partners with lower incomes. And you see, you don't see marriage rates ri rising. And I could say a lot about why, because I think for the most part, people aren't necessarily interested in marriage, not marriage. They're interested in stable relationships and having economic resources is part of what helps relationships actually feel stable. So we see relationships and families more stable. We see folks, non-custodial fathers, more able to actually contribute and be involved in their kids' lives. And that has spillover effects too. That's also obviously for the the neighborhood for the community, just having more folks involved in engaged family life is a, a good thing that I think all of us strive for. And part of why anyone wants to work is to have the resources to be able to do that and engage with your family with that kind of resource structure. But also it potentially has spillover effects for the next generation because far, far better for kids to grow up in, in a space where they have two parents who are providing resources and two parents who are able to, to work and do that and parent together. And at lowest, right, this is like a long list of ways that you can think about both for adults right now, but also the next generation's worth of kids, if you're growing up in a household where there's somewhat less stress around money and around social status in some ways, and in terms of what that confers from work, that has really potentially powerful effects on family dynamics, on all kinds of potential health outcomes and stress long-term outcomes for kids. We also know from the literature that that matters a fair bit for what predicts sort of success um, on all kinds of outcomes, including employment and the potential for criminal activity and general life happiness, kind of all of that flows. So on the one hand, it's like, it's not that low employment is a silver bullet for all of these things, but the spillover effects and the ways that kind of what comes along with a low, a low unemployment environment for workers, for families, for communities, for the economy as a whole, is really potentially powerful. So so would you say that there's an effect on incarceration rates and, and crime rates? And I know those aren't cleanly linked, but is there an effect on those? We didn't study the impact on crime rates. I would say this, there has been a great deal of public attention given to rising crime rates around the country. They're rising from what was a historically low level. And the trajectory matters in the public imagination and is very troubling to people. But Crime rates are not even close to what they were in the bad old days. And so I'm not diminishing the, the psychological significance of crime rates or the difficulties that it's posing in particular places. So the recent election results for the mayor of Chicago are, are you know, clearly pivoted around crime rates in central city business districts. And that is a problem in San, in San Francisco, in Chicago, and in a number of other places. Uh, but overall... I don't think that we're seeing a spike in crime that takes us back to the bad old days. What we are seeing is an increase, you know, relative to a fairly rosy recent past. But we did not study crime rates specifically, and I think that's that's just a topic for other researchers. The one thing I'd add to that, too, is just one of the things that I've been trying to figure out in the context of the research that we were doing for the book, tried to figure out at the time, was just good ways of linking um, criminal records, crime, kind of crime-affiliated data and crime-affiliated individual trajectories and history with earnings, employment, all of these other kind of economic outcomes that we're talking about. 
and this is an example, and I'm sure you know you could do a whole separate podcast on like data and particular data over time, which is so important for actually measuring like cause and effect and how these things relate and how a person's life unfolds, like incredibly important. But this is definitely a space that I would highlight as one where, and I'm sure that folks who are real experts in this space and in criminal justice and, and justice involved individuals could add a ton to this. But my takeaway is that this is a space where there is a ton of room for just doing a better job linking the data sets so that we can actually answer the kinds of questions that you're asking and that Catherine and I were able to ask and kind of start poking around the edges, but we really didn't feel like there was a particularly kind of methodologically sound, honest way to get a good answer anytime soon on this, which isn't to say it's impossible. The one thing that we did highlight and it is important to us is the labor market prospects of people who have been under in criminal justice arms. And there we do have something to say. Uh, and it is an extraordinary improvement. The you know, unemployment rates of people with criminal records go way, way down when there are opportunities in the labor market. And when employers actually just don't have too many choices, they end up turning to this labor source. And if you know, not won't happen universally, but we have some interviews in the book in which you got people with really deep criminal justice involvement. I mean, pretty unsavory characters in many ways who come out of the prison system and suddenly discover that they can get a job. And if they work hard at that job, they will be promoted and uh, they're not unemployed at all. And that is not what they were expecting. And it's not what would have happened to them in very slack labor markets. So if we really want to improve the recidivism picture, getting people into the labor force and sh and demonstrating very clearly that they have the ability for a steady paycheck, there is probably no better tonic than that. Yeah. Well, and the last thing I'll say on this, and I imagine that you'd love to, <laughs> to, to change the topic or move on, but I do want to put one last um, one last idea out there because I think the the policy environment has changed in conjunction with the this very tight labor market that we have enjoyed as a country for now, with the exception of the COVID blip for, for many years. And it was, I don't think it's a coincidence that at that same time, you saw some large employers, um, the JP Morgan Chase and a number of other very large employers or leads on a second chance hiring coalition, which is businesses really focusing on the fact that our failure to successfully reintegrate folks who have records have potentially served that we, we were excluding a huge portion of people that's causing spillover effects and costing society a huge amount. And I don't think it's a coincidence that that's happened at the same time when employers, because of the nature of the labor market with things being very tight, had to expand who they were willing to think about, who they were willing to think about hiring. And so, you know, there's all kinds of policy follow-ons that you can think about and that are certainly part of the conversation in terms of what, make, what might make that approach to hiring and who you think about hiring more durable and completely tied to the fact that employers are maybe a little bit more desperate for workers and so they're willing to consider a broader population. There's also a certain level of just thinking about ways to think about our justice system as one where people can actually be treated as either rehabilitated or wrongfully involved in it in the first place, right? And not have that be kind of a branding stamping of who you are indefinitely. Yeah, so let's dig into that a little bit, because there is a chapter in your book, your book, Moving the Needle, where you talk to an employer, someone who owns a waste management business, I believe, and he talks about, you know, what the climate is like in a tight labor market for him. And he generally has trouble finding employees. I think employee, employers generally have a harder time finding people during a tight labor market. But for this person, and you can go into detail about, you know, how employers respond, but he ended up adjusting what he was looking for. and how he finds more reliable employees. Yes, yeah, so you're right. He was in the waste management business and he suddenly found that he just wasn't getting applicants at all. And so he started searching around and usually in this circumstance, he people like him will rely on what we call brokers or intermediaries who help source workers for them. And he did that, but he also began making connections with the sheriff's office and looking at people who were coming out of the prison system. And he, what he found was that he could hire people who turned out to be reliable, not 100% of the time, but the people he always hires are not reliable 100% of the time. And what he discovered was that there was talent there, especially talent when it came to blue, certain blue collar skills and construction and recycling and that he could make use of. 
as long as he was willing to put in more training dollars. And that's important. What employers need to do and find they have to do and do when they bring in people with unconventional backgrounds is invest more in them, invest more in their human capital, teach them skills they don't have, help them to gain licenses like special driver's licenses, which you need in a hauling business because they don't walk in the front door with those attributes as they would in a very slack labor market. But you invest in them and you turn them into people who are then more valuable to you. And then you have to open up pathways, and he did, pathways of upward mobility inside the company because otherwise they'll jump ship to another employer who can make use of those skills. So the whole trajectory of hiring, who you consider, how you find them, what you invest in them once you've got them, how you promote them, how you pay them has changed dramatically. I've written a lot about people who were in the fast food industry over the last 20, 30 years because it was a canonical low-wage job. And when I first began writing about this industry, these were minimum wage jobs with no benefits at all. Today, if you go to work for McDonald's, for example, you will be exceeding $15 an hour. You will have paid vacation. You will have college tuition covered. You will have sick days. None of those benefits and certainly none of those wages were available in periods where labor markets were slack. So even those entry level, not very uh, exciting jobs in some ways begin to pay a lot more. And when they pay a lot more, it's, it's to the employer's benefit to invest even more in training the workforce because they will get that much more out of them in terms of productivity. So it is really a remarkable upward mobility machine, tight labor markets. Another issue that's really important is that, you know, after decades and decades of rising inequality and especially gaps between African-American workers and others, we're starting to see those gaps close. And one of the reasons is that wages rise faster at the bottom than anywhere else in a tight labor market. And so, you know, we have sought that elusive recipe for closing racial gaps. And I wouldn't say it's we're done with this. We're not. But there is very clear improvement in that gap closing. And it's mainly because it's the jobs at the bottom that tend to rise fastest. And that is one of the discoveries in our book that I think is really important. Yeah, so we've had tight labor markets before, right? And they haven't necessarily helped close the gap on inequality. Like what's different right now? And I'm thinking back on the Obama administration, you know, following the Great Recession, you know, we did get, you know, we had some pretty low unemployment rates. But one of the criticisms was that, you know, you're getting lots of low paying jobs and they don't have benefits. So what's specific about this particular time that's making it better? That's kind of closing the inequality gap. So I'm going to let Elizabeth take most of this because she's really the expert on how often and when have we had tight labor markets and how tight do they have to get and for how long before we start to see these benefits? But what I would say specifically about the Obama years is that in the wake of the Great Recession, we had very weak policy responses, and that's partly because we had a very divided Congress, but we didn't inject very much money. We didn't create child allowances. We didn't protect people from eviction. There there are thousands of things we did in the most recent COVID recession that helped to turn the corner on the economy very quickly that we didn't do in previous recessions. And I do think that the speed of government action and investment has a lot to do with how quickly we emerged out of that recession. But it turns out this is not the only period by any means that labor markets have been tight enough to make a difference. There have been a number in the past, and our book traces this over 70 odd years to look at when they happen, how long they last and who they benefit. Elizabeth, do you want to pick up where I left off? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you covered the... the a number of the key points, but just a a clear answer to your question of how low do unemployment rates need to be to see these effects start to take hold. And we find looking, as Catherine said, decades worth of data and looking over a number of theoretically tight labor markets, you know, time where if you look at your standard table of the business cycle and you see like the gray shading, this is for all the, the econ wonks who listen to your podcast will be familiar with the gray shading that shows you a recession. Um, It's not just any old bounce back from a recession. 
and and the old bounce back with the labor market where you see some of these positive effects start to take hold. The unemployment rate needs to be below 4.5%, ideally below 4% for a relatively sustained period of time. So like a year plus. And we haven't seen that very many times. We've seen that in the 90s with kind of the dot-com boom. And we saw some of this same traction for folks at the very bottom, gaining employment, holding on to employment, seeing, seeing their earnings rise. But things, things fell apart. Things often fall apart. There's a reason why business cycles are called business cycles, because things that go up in theory must come down. What's really unique about what's happened happening right now is, you know, your note on uh, Catherine's point about the slow recovery coming off of the Great Recession. There are two additional points I'd make there. One is the depth of the recession was just unprecedented. I mean, prior to COVID and the COVID-driven recession being the like most unprecedented thing ever, like the financial crisis and the forces behind that recession and the depth of the fallout was just, it was phenomenal. It was global. And on top of that, I agree with Catherine that the policy response didn't necessarily match the, the depth of, of the problem. And so we saw a very slow and relatively unequal recovery that took some time to really get traction, but it did. It did get traction and it was interrupted by COVID and then bounced back in no small part because the response to COVID and the flooding of both people and communities with dollars to try and prevent the destruction that we know happens. And we have this additional like people are dying thing that I think really motivated even a very divided federal government to actually act and act quickly. And we've seen follow on with the current administration really continuing to try and support as much as they can in the context of a very different political situation and a waning pandemic as a motivator. But I think all of that has come together to make this particular stretch a really unique time where some of what we could pull out in the data and look at over time and identify that kind of magic number of below 4.5 and for somewhere around a year to 18 months at least being the really kind of crucial start point. There are these additional factors where, you know, I can't say that it's like a purely causal, precisely identified relationship. That would be an overstretch. But there are really good theoretical reasons and practical reasons based on both the data, the quantitative data and our interviews and our observations in communities um, that the response, this combination of kind of macroeconomic plus the policy response that's come along with it has been really important. And I think it's it's exciting. There's still a ton of work to do, but in the absence of the economy crashing and the Federal Reserve crashing the economy purpose in some ways to rein in inflation, right? There's like, there's a ton of potential for figuring out how to actually make sure that we don't lose the gains that what I think we typically think of as exceptional labor markets, but in some ways I'd like this book to have us change our thinking and our framework for what counts as exceptional and what counts as normal. Like what if the normal is something like what we've existed in and how do we hold on to that and make that kind of the, the new normal as opposed to having this be the exception as opposed to the rule. I was thinking back to the Great Recession and following that, I think it dropped down to something like 4.7%, but not that magic number to, you know, below 4.5%, if I remember correctly. And there was a lot of, you know, due to the political climate, probably a lot of like trepidation around policy. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, yeah. So, you know, that said, so we're here now. <laughs> and so you said like 4.5% and below for longer than one year. Yeah. Yeah. And ideally longer than 18 months, but I'd, I'd say that you can start to see traction in the data at about a year under 4.5%. So, you know, I was listening to the news this morning and, you know, the Fed, they are considering raising interest rates again. And, you know, we would typically expect to see an increase in, in unemployment rates. Is that unavoidable? Is that inevitable? What should we make of that? Well, I can't say that it's inevitable because the Fed has been raising interest rates for some time now at a fairly rapid clip, and we aren't seeing much movement. The unemployment rate continues to decline, so it clearly isn't an absolute as night follows day. But if you make money more expensive, you make it harder for businesses to expand. Uh, one imagines that at some point you will start to see this downward pressure making a difference. And in some sectors, it is. I mean, out here in California, there's a lot of attention being drawn to the layoffs in the tech sector. But most of those people have been able to find new jobs very quickly because labor markets are so tight. Um, whether or not that continues to be the case is an open question. But one of the points that we wanted to make is that we should think very, very carefully about this particular remedy to inflation. First, you know, there are more experts out there that you could tap who are who really know a lot more about inflation than we do. But there are some very special circumstances that help to fuel inflation in this particular moment, especially energy costs, you know, connected to the war in Ukraine, 
uh, supply chain problems that were connected to COVID. And as those two th things start to resolve, we're starting to see some of the pressure of inflation lessen. Nonetheless, it is an often tried and true method of the Federal Reserve to attempt to pull unemployment up in order to diminish wage demands. I think the thing we want to focus on here is the benefits of tight labor markets, not only in terms of individual prosperity, but in terms of reducing the cost and the frequency of need of our social safety net. If people have jobs, they aren't as likely to need unemployment insurance. If they have jobs, they are more likely to have health care. If they have jobs, they tend to stay in, their children tend to stay in school. There are all kinds of positive things that happen that lessen the burden on society because people are able to take care of themselves. And wouldn't we really rather have them do that as opposed to trying to clean up after the messes that are created by inequality and high levels of unemployment? After all, unemployment interrupts the development of human capital. It makes it harder for people to get back into the game. It creates these periods of interrupted resources for households, puts pressure on housing, and creates higher eviction rates. All of those ills are really difficult to remedy fast enough to stop people from entering a kind of downward vortex. But if we keep people in the labor market and keep them moving up, as has been happening we have more chances to see them prosper on their own and build their own safety nets. And that's really what we would like people to understand. Yes, inflation is a problem. It's, it's a very deep problem for the lowest wage workers in our country. They are paying way more for food. They are you know, forced to pay more to get to work in terms of transportation. So it's, it's not that inflation is not an issue. It's a very serious issue. But I think we underappreciate what benefits we receive as a society from having a higher proportion of our people in the labor market. That's really the very best long-term medicine in our view. Elizabeth, do you want to add to that? So what I was going to say was just about the, the housing market in particular, and this is something that came up in our research. It comes up in public conversation. One of the things that is both driving prices and also driving continued instability and continued kind of barriers to opportunity, even for folks who've gotten a handhold in the labor market or a foothold in the, in the labor market in the context of a tight labor market is the cost of housing. And so some of that, I am not a housing policy person. It's one of the like only spaces in the economic policy mobility space in terms of policy implications that I put up like a big brick wall and said like, I don't, I don't do that because it is so complicated and so full of people who can say much more intelligent things than I can. But I can tell you that when you talk to folks about work and you talk to folks about their ability to actually have their wages keep up with the cost of housing, particularly in some of these labor markets where, um, you know, business is going gangbusters and there's a lot of labor market opportunity, the ability to actually have safe, stable, secure housing uh, becomes increasingly challenging because housing costs go up. And on top of that, I think there is, you know, something to be said for a much stronger system where we support folks housing and recognize that there are just some basic market failures that even if we build as much housing as we possibly can to correct for the mismatch between supply and demand, which is where I think the smartest housing policy people will go very quickly, there's st that's still going to take time. And so thinking about how we actually revisit how we think about supporting housing and supporting folks who are fortunate enough to actually have publicly supported housing right now because there's so many folks who don't have it who would be eligible, but there's just more demand than supply. We talked to numerous folks like that who were facing a real catch-22 because they had more labor income, um, and that was really exciting, but they were on kind of a hamster wheel in terms of trying to keep up with what it would mean to really truly be, quote-unquote, financially independent because they had nowhere near enough to actually be able to afford housing where they live. So it's, it's a note that it's slightly different from inflation. It's related to the inflation conversation. But when you think about what more income and particularly more income from work, work means, even in the context of rising wages, there's a broader context around folks and a broader kind of support that I think, um, and again, this is something that we talk about pretty extensively in moving the needle, is how we can think about our social support and public benefit system as part of that opportunity springboard and not just as a safety net or a handout for people who've really kind of fallen between the cracks, that there are ways of public really kind of critically rethinking what we want public benefits to do and how we want to do them and who we offer them to, which could pretty fundamentally, I think, transform and really harness some of the opportunity that happens when folks are able to work and really make the most of it in a more durable, durable way. But that means taking the cost of living thing really seriously.
Yeah. I want to just go back to, to inflation just for a second, because the news cycles are all talking about inflation. How do you suggest that they address inflation versus the way that they're you know thinking about addressing it now? Well, I think we need to begin with some hard questions for people who really specialize in this area about the drivers of inflation. Because if the drivers are in, you know, energy costs, gasoline prices, natural gas prices, then, you know, increasing unemployment isn't going to take those things down. And they are starting to come down in their own natural way. And so we need to do what we can to see that that trajectory improves. The supply chain issues also have nothing to do with rising wages. They have they had to do with COVID and bottlenecks that developed. And they those were really big drivers. There, there's a third third issue, and it's kind of a third rail too, which is that we are seeing really enormous profit taking in the in the private sector. And we can debate what is appropriate profit levels. I, I don't think I have a, a strong opinion on that point. But we are really seeing record profits as companies are taking advantage of this inflationary environment to raise their prices and reap huge benefits. They're just a wash in, in, you know, in profit. And so if those three things are playing an important role in generating inflation, there have to be other remedies besides throwing average Americans into unemployment, which, you know, only after many, many years will you see that take price rises down as people are not able to be part of the demand curve. So, again, you, you'll need to invite other experts on this topic. And, and I think of people like Paul Krugman, who've written a lot about this as experts worth talking to. But what we'd like to do, again, is just to direct people's attention to the incredible benefits of keeping our workforce occupied, keeping people who've been on the margins of the economy right smack in the middle of it, building up their human capital, building up their opportunities for economic progression. And then the last issue, which Elizabeth raised, which I think is terribly important, trying to convert our social safety net, or at least bear in mind, its potential for increasing assets. We have a national obsession with free riders. We think that if we enable people to have a benefit like a Section 8 housing voucher, that somehow they'll become indolent and stop working. And there is no evidence to support that at all. And in fact, what we see is that people who've been at the bottom, who start to move up, quite, pretty quickly eclipse the, the, the sort of ceiling that they can, uh, they can maintain and still hold on to their housing, for example. So we have families that are earning more money. Their children are earning more money. And all of a sudden, they're at risk of losing the one roof over their head, which they couldn't really replace with their earnings. They're not at that level yet. They might be if allowed to keep ascending. But, you know, at first blush, they're really going to just run out of their housing and they can't afford that. So what happens? The family starts to fission. The kids who'd like to live at home and, and the families that like to keep pooling their money suddenly can't. They've got to send somebody out of the household in order to keep that income threshold below the qualifying level. This makes no sense. It makes a lot more sense to allow those families to aggregate those resources, keep building an asset, and hopefully at some point in a more generous way, enable them to, to enter the home ownership market. Now, that's not easy everywhere. It would be very difficult in very expensive cities, but people are resourceful and they know what they want. And they, what they want is economic security and stability. And they will go a very long way to try to afford it. But we need to think about how we help people get into that market rather than how we throw them off of benefit programs, which make it impossible for them to continue this ascent. So as Elizabeth said, we want to advocate for thinking about the American safety net as something more than an emergency, an emergency underneath you, an emergency support structure underneath you, but a springboard to upward mobility beyond which you won't need those benefits anymore. But isn't that kind of a partisan issue, right? You know, there's one party who is kind of pro-social safety net and one who's kind of against it, right? Which is why this is cyclical, right? You know, I mean, over my lifetime, it's been cyclical. You have low, you know, unemployment rates and then they go up and they go down. So a couple of things. One, I will say, I do think that there's, there's a very clear partisan and ideological divide, which I think transcends just partisanship. I do think there's some ideology behind it around the idea of what it means to be responsible, what opportunity means, the role of government, and there are clear partisan divisions. But, um, but there, there's 
they're not crystal clear. That's number one. Number two, I would also say that part of our conversion of our safety net into one that really is kind of an emergency stopgap and that offers very, very little at this point was actually under Clinton in the 90s, right? The kind of ending welfare as we know it, which isn't to say that the system that we replaced was doing all the things that we're talking about. It fully wasn't, but we made a concerted choice as a country to go in a certain direction. And that was at a time when the labor market was quite tight, right? There's a lesson there, I think, because tight labor markets were like, hey, anyone can work who wants to. So anyone who's receiving benefits is kind of, they are that free rider layabout. Um, We kind of forgot about the fact that A, the benefits potentially need to be much more generous than they are to do talk about them facilitating doing. And B, what goes up does eventually come down in many cases, um, and that there are many reasons why people may or may not be able to work. So that's that's kind of response number one. Number two, in terms of policy responses and how to think about all of this, I do think there's an opportunity here for framing this in terms of a what's really going to generate long-term mobility and self-sufficiency for working Americans. And granted, there are still plenty of lines of exclusion that parties will draw, but I think that there is particularly given, there's new evidence in the book and there's plenty of evidence out there already that theoretically, at least folks who are interested in taking evidence seriously and having that be part of what informs the conversation um, with a big asterisk there, because I recognize that a lot of what's happened to politics in America at this point is that There's a clear divide in terms of who takes evidence seriously and who doesn't, but that's beyond the scope of what Catherine and I do in life, right? Like we leave figuring that one out for people who are political consultants in the spirit of actually trying to provide some evidence that might help unlock some possibility. I think there's something potentially tractable here. And one, just to give a specific example to think about the benefits clips conversation, right? This is something that the idea that if you earn over a certain amount, all of a sudden you kind of face a clip and you have real trade-offs between whether you work more, whether you work at all, because you potentially are going to lose access to benefits that in many cases may outstrip the value of additional work. There are all kinds of ways that we could experiment with and change how we handle that kind of phasing out of benefits. So as to make the entire public benefit system, far more of the springboard that we're talking about, as opposed to kind of this safety net that pull the rug out from under you as soon as you start to get anything resembling a sense of balance. It's like taking someone who's like doing tree pose in a yoga class and like as soon as they get their balance, just like kicking them over, right? That's like basically how our system is structured. And I so I think there's space there. And I don't think that that has to be a partisan issue at all. That's one. And then the other thing I'd say in terms of just thinking about potential for um, kind of cross aisle or potentially nonpartisan issues that have come up, this is separate from the benefit system and going back to some of this thinking about who is a potentially worthwhile employee to invest in is some of the, the criminal justice reform related stuff and the skills based hiring stuff, which we haven't talked about at all. But this is, again, in the bucket of what we were talking about earlier in the conversation of thinking about how to actually change both policy and practice to open doors to folks who've been historically included from even getting a foothold in the labor market and working, obviously separate from from a conversation about benefits policy, but in the buckets of things that are actually could be policy and not just kind of count on the goodwill slash self-interest of employers when times are good, could become codified kind of regardless of what the economy looks like. I think those are some fundamental changes that we could make and that we see traction on, right? You've got a number of states, for example, that are saying that, you know, they now are using skills-based credentials as opposed to having like an educational credential hired to even consider you as a job applicant. They're now willing to consider skills. And there's a whole separate line of questioning around how do you measure skills and what does that mean? But it really does up open opportunity um, in a pretty fundamental way for some folks who've historically been excluded. And that's a policy lever that we could certainly uh, be pulling on. One of the things that was really interesting to me as we were working our way through all of our research and figuring out how we were going to write it up, and in particular thinking about the policy chapter, is that ultimately in some ways what tight labor markets fundamentally do is tilt the balance of power towards workers in not in a, you know, completely, you know, the scales have tipped over towards workers, but given how out of whack the balance has been for so long in this country, and we could have a long conversation about that, but there's lots and lots of evidence that worker power has declined. You can see that in unionization rates, you can see it in falling wages, you can see it in our very flat declining value minimum wage. I could list a lot of different examples. One of the things that happens quote unquote, naturally, when the labor market is very tight, is that all of a sudden workers are just generally more empowered to bargain for what they want, and what they care about, as as 
when it comes to actually coming to the table with an, an employer to the extent that you can imagine, like theoretically a worker, an employer coming to a table and bargaining. And so much of what we see in terms of accruing, the advantages you see accruing to workers in the context of a tight labor market come from that reshifting or rebalancing, and I would say kind of correcting of the balance of of power between workers and employers in kind of what drives the economy. And I think that's fundamentally a good thing. And it's part of what opens so much of the opportunity and the potential in everything from employers changing their practices in public policies that seemed like they were off the table, all of a sudden becoming something that people are at least talking about or considering, but also just fundamentally really having meaningful impacts on people's lives in some pretty fundamental ways that have the potential for longer term change across generations. And that's exciting. Well, Catherine Newman and Elizabeth Jacobs, thank you so much for joining me. Your book is titled Moving the Needle, What Tight Labor Markets Do for the Poor. Some really important lessons in there, and it's truly been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much. We've enjoyed it, too. Likewise. Thank you, Jen.